Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. Christ is all I need. Christ is all I need. All I need. Sing that chorus with me, please. Christ is all I need. 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 All I Turn to page number 127. Page number 127. Let's all stand. 127. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. To take him at his word. Just to rest. Upon his promise to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, I proved him all I know. Jesus, Jesus, just Jesus, oh by grace to trust him more. Oh how sweet to trust in Jesus, to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me, the healing cleansing blood, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, I proved him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, by grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee. Just Jesus, save your friend, and I know that thou art with me. Be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. I prove 
the more I know. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, for grace to trust Him more. doesn't do good to get old. Forget things. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us and for what you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day, uh, Lord, that you've provided for us. And it's unusual for us to have this kind of type of weather this time of year, but uh, we're thankful for everything that you send, Lord. Uh, we, we want to complain about all the heat and all the humidity and all of that. Uh, then we want to gripe because we don't have rain, and then we gripe because we have too much rain. Lord, we we just not satisfied with what we have. But Lord, every once in a while, you just drop us a handful on purpose, and we're so thankful for that. This morning, as we're thinking about that handful on purpose, we thank you, Lord, for uh, everyone that's here that's here this morning. Uh, Lord, you've given us uh, a handful on purpose. Uh, Lord, you've provided with us with visitors. You've provided us with uh, with uh, home folk to uh, be here. And Lord, I I just pray that as we come together, as we worship you. Uh, that we will worship you in spirit and in truth. That we'll put aside everything that's uh, trying to fight for our minds, for uh, for our thoughts, for uh, things that are going on at work or home or wherever it might be. Help us to put all of that aside and focus on the reason that we're here today, and that's because of you. Father, we pray for those who are unable to be here. Pray for Miss Helen as she recovers from her surgery. Uh, pray, Father, for uh, Brother J.L. as he goes to rehab, Lord, that you would help him, Lord, to regain uh, the use of... Uh, uh, his body, Lord, is uh, from the stroke. We just pray, Father, that everything that you do, uh, Lord, would be done according to your mercies and your grace. We thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning's worship services of Garth Road Baptist Church. If you will, I'd like to point out Psalm 27 to you. I'm going to read just the first six verses. We talked about this in our Sunday school class this morning. We talked about joy versus happiness. It said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that it will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies around about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the what we're here today. We serve a mighty Lord. We're here to sing praises to Him. We're here to inquire in His temple, and we're here to behold His beauty through His Word and through the preaching of His man. And that's a wonderful place to be. The good thing about that, too, is we get a joy out of that that transcends happiness, that transcends what happens to us. And it's a good thing to be here this morning. And I'm very glad you're here to join us today. You could have chose anywhere to be, and you chose to be here with us at Garth Road Baptist Church, and I thank you. Um, if you're a visitor today, what I'm going to ask you, if you did not receive one of these today as you came in, if you would look in front of you, in front of the seat, uh, there should be a card. If you would fill it out and place it in the offering plate as it comes by, we'd love to have a record of your visit. If you're a visitor, true, um, we hope you come as a visitor, but it, it is our honest um, honest appraisal. We hope you leave us. We do. Um, okay, Sunday school starts at 10 a.m. always on Sunday. Our worship service is at 11. Our evening service on Sundays is at 6 p.m. However, beginning Sunday, November 1st, our Sunday evening service is going to change until 5 p.m. We're going to give you a little bit of warning. And uh, on Wednesday evenings, our services are at 7 p.m. Those are very special services. That's where we dig into to the really deep doctrinal issues that, that, that are in the Word of God. In fact, the pastor is doing a really good uh, series of lessons on unity. Uh, Reformers Unanimous meets every Friday at 7 p.m., and it's a wonderful addictions program where you see people being being freed and delivered from the sins that beset them. You see the power of God working in these lives, and it is a wonderful thing. Lighthouse Baptist Academy registration is still open, and so if you know folks that are looking for 
for a really good Christian-based educational experience for their children, we do have a K-4 through 12th grade school that is, that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, again, thank you for being here today. I know everyone's going to get a blessing from the service. Thank you. All right, let's stand to turn to page number 363. Page number 363. We'll ask the men come forward to see the offering on the last course. 363. Sing them over I can to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of mine. Christ the blessed one gives to all. Nerless to the loving call. Wonderful words of life. All so freely given. Wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. This morning, as uh, Brother Kirk normally does, receives the offering. Uh, he had to take Ms. Shiza home. She got sick, and so he uh, had to take her home, so that's why he left. Uh, so just be in prayer for her, if you will. Uh, also, just remember, as we receive the offering this morning, that uh, the Bible teaches us that God loves a cheerful giver. And as we give, uh, we give with hilarity. Uh, you know, I've never seen anybody at Walmart uh, just so thankful that they only had to pay $300 for their groceries. You know, I mean... I went into the grocery store yesterday, and I'm going, man, we came out with nothing. And so uh, I'm so thankful to be old, though. You get that extra discount for Kroger products. But but I don't ever shout, and go, praise God, I got you. But when we come to the Lord and we give, we ought to be thankful that we have to give. God's provided for us. He's provided a job for us, and uh, he's provided our income. He's taken care of us abundantly and above all that we could ask or think. And so we give with thanksgiving and we give with praise. As we bow for prayer, Brother Jason, you need some prayer, please. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you now, one, we want to pray for Brother Kurt and his wife as she's sick and he had to leave. We pray for that God to take care of that, heal her. Father, we ask you to bless this service today. Go, Brother Jim, from the Holy Spirit, God, so we may get a blessing, God, and that we walk out of here a little bit closer to you. Father, we ask you to bless this offering. Use it for your work and will, God. We love you and we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. It's not just the pitch itself. Cool.
visually shocked and horrified by the shooting deaths of 21 people in the morning rampage. And I'm 
standing all alone. Lord, let these words be what I say to you. I choose to fight. I choose the right. I choose to take a stand like those gone on before. No doubt I'll win. Christ will defend. There's no turning back until I reach that shore. I choose the Like a farmer in the field and a sower sowing seed, my light must shine to those still lost in sin. So I press toward the prize with a gleam in my eyes, and this my cry until I reach the end. I reach the end. I choose to fight, I choose the right, I choose to take a stand like those gone on before, no doubt I'll win, Christ will defend, there's no turning back until I reach that shore, I choose the I am not ashamed of the Christ who died for me. I'll wave his blood-stained banner until he calls for me. He calls for me. I choose to fight. I choose the right. I choose to take a stand like those gone on before. No doubt I will win, Christ will defend, there's no turning back until I reach that shore, I choose the Lord, no doubt I will win, Christ will defend, there's no turning back until I reach that shore, I choose the Lord. I choose the Lord. Thank you, Amanda. Go we'll take your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter number three, the book of Revelation, chapter number three. While you're turning there, by way of introduction, just let me say that uh, I was saved in 1972, and as a result of uh, my salvation, I realized that uh, this world was in a wicked place <laughs> uh, back then, and uh, I was only 16 years old, and I, I began to uh, hear the preaching of the Word of God and read the Word of God, and I always uh, was uh, intrigued with uh, prophecy and uh, what my pastor always had to say, and uh, uh, I came up with this conclusion when I was 16 years old in 1972 that the Lord has to come back no later than 1975. I mean, it was a wicked, wicked place. Now, some of you aren't even old enough to remember 1975. And so, uh, 1975 came and went. I said, it has to be 1980. It has to be 1985. And as I continue to study the Bible, I realized that none of us know the day nor the hour according to Matthew chapter 24, verse 36. No man knows uh, when the Lord's coming back. We, we definitely don't know that. Uh, but we can see signs. And I've said this over and over again over the last uh, several months, that uh, what we're seeing happen in America today is like reading the local newspaper, watching the daily newscast, if you can believe what they tell you. And uh, it, it's just amazing how the Bible is unfolding in our day and time. John the uh, Apostle wrote the book of Revelations, and uh, in the book of Revelation, he, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, revealed what's going to happen in these last days. Jesus wrote uh, seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and those were churches that were in existence in that period of time, 
and uh, each one of them had a, a commendation and a condemnation. A commendation meaning that you, uh, God was commending them, the Lord was commending them for their service because of their uh, continual uh, work in, in serving God. But then there were some things that were inconsistent with the Bible, the Word of God. And as you go through, there's the, uh, the, the six churches that are there, and, and several of them have uh, major condemnations because of uh, idolatry and because of uh, the Nicolaitans and the worship of the Nicolaitans and, and all of these things. And yet, we come to the last church, the church of the Laodiceans, or I should say the church in Laodicea, uh, because it's different from all the other churches, uh, and that's where we're going to be today. If, I, if you would uh, mind standing with me in reference to the reading of the Word of God, we're going to read Revelation chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 22 this morning. Revelation chapter number 3, verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter number 3, verse number 14 says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, notice this, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that thou, the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with, my, with me in my throne, even as I, am also, I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I want to call your attention back to verse number 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, the down, downward trend in America. The downward trend in America. Let us pray. Fathers, we bow before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for America. Lord, the videos that we saw this morning are uh, characteristic, Lord, of, of what's going on uh, in our society today. Lord, these videos are, were characteristic, Lord, of, of the downward trend in America. And do we find these trends in the, in the Word of God? And yes, we do. And Father, I just pray this morning that your church, your people, the Garth Road Baptist Church, would repent as Jesus called. And that we would stand in these last days against the wickedness and the, uh, and the perversions that are uh, spreading across our land. Lord, that we might honor you and serve you with our lives. Father, we ask your blessings this morning. I pray that you'd fill me with thy Holy Spirit with power. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. These verses plainly describe the climate of America in our day and time. There are those who maintain the facade or the idea that uh, of religion and the rituals that uh, has been practiced for years in America. When I was a kid, there were certain things that were uh, acceptable on a Sunday and certain things were not acceptable. Uh, those of you like me that are older than, than dirt, I mean older than, uh, uh, than probably 60 or so, I'll, I'll say older than 55, 50, uh, those of us probably remember some of those things. I remember that uh, at my grandparents' house, even though my grandparents never went to church, they raised 15 kids, and... Uh, they weren't allowed to do certain things on Sunday. My grandmother made sure the meal was cooked on Saturday and put on the table with a tablecloth. Today we go, salmonella! <laughs> I don't know how they made it, but they made it without us dying. But I remember that distinctly. I remember that my, one of my uncles was walking through the house one day whistling, and my grandfather got all over him. You don't whistle on the Lord's Day. You know, I mean, there were just certain things that, that were common. 
uh, we were taught the respect of uh, uh, common decencies. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Uh, please. Thank you. And uh, we weren't uh, uh, allowed to get by without saying those common courtesies. In fact, even today, I say yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yesterday, we walked into a store, uh, and I was holding the door, and uh, uh, or we were walk actually walking into Luby's, and there was a couple of ladies. There was one lady; she was older. They were uh, she, she was blind, and they were trying to let her in. And I stood there and held the door until she got there. The lady said, "Oh, go ahead." I said, "Not on your life." I said, "My daddy taught me, ladies go first. Ladies go first." And I stood there and I held the door for those ladies to go through that door. My wife had already gone through the door. My son and I stood back and we waited until they went through and then we went in and we picked up where we left off and, and, and went and got our food. You say, really? In our society today, people don't do that. I know. We go to the doctor. Sometimes we have a female doctor and she'll hold the door and I said, sorry, <laughs> you got to go first. <laughs> you got to go first. That's just ingrained in me. That is the, the way that I was raised. And today, you know, I, sometimes I want to trip guys. They get out of the car and they head towards the, towards the, uh, the restaurant and they head towards the store. Their wife's 20 paces behind. And they get in, they walk in, they go in, they sit down and get their menu out or they, they start and I'm going, no wonder divorce is rampant. No wonder that people don't have respect for one another. No wonder, I mean, the children are, are just tripping over their parents to get ahead. I'm going, I just can't deal with that. I was born in the wrong time period. And, and we see, I mean, the, the common courtesies and the common decencies and the common practices that we were raised with, the, the morality uh, that we were raised with, the morals that we were raised with have changed so much. And we have gone down, 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 and down. I remember distinctly in 1963 when the prayer was uh, voted by the Supreme Court out of schools. The Bible reading out of schools. I, I remember that so distinctly. I remember uh, when uh, uh, when they came within, with segregation and, and all of the people in Mississippi that had, that had funds, they put their kids in private schools and those of us who didn't have funds went to the public school with the, with, the rest of the, uh, with the rest of the kids. We didn't have any problems. We were treated with respect. They were, were treated with respect. But you see, there was a downward trend in America. In 1973, Roe versus Wade was passed and the Supreme Court upheld the uh, the idea of abortion. You realize that America since that and since 1973 have aborted over 55 million unborn innocent children with the idea it's my choice. No. <laughs> Your choice happened before the child came about. I'm trying to be discreet here, but the choice was made already. Now you live with the consequences of your choice. You see, personally, we see a, a major demise of America. Do you realize that America is the number one promoter of abortion around the world? The number one promoter. They send delegates to other nations Abortion. Do you think God's going to <laughs> allow us to get by with that? I don't think so. America at one time was the greatest missionary society on planet Earth. America was founded according to our forefathers on Christian principles. Those Christian principles uh, were based upon the Word of God, upon the, the mandates of the Bible, the Word of God, even though our current president said, oh, no, we've never been a Christian nation. No, <laughs> He just read the wrong history book. He was in Kenya about that time. Hello? You see, the problem is that now we have come to the place of 
approving what God has disapproved. Approving of what God has disapproved. God calls the, 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 the sin an abomination in His sight. It's a wickedness. And yet, in, our, in America today, we're parading up and down the streets of, of New York and Houston and other areas and, uh, with gay pride. And, 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 and I'm amazed at the number of people that support that. Church members, church people. And you go, well, it's about love. That's what they always say. We have a right to love. You know where that started? For those of you who remember, in the 1960s, in California, free love. Peace, man, peace. They moved to their communes, and they began to change the ideas of America. And it's crossed all 50 states. You see, God has made a judgment here. And God's word is clear and God's word is plain. And God's word will always stand when man fails. We're in a spiritual decline, a spiraling out of control. Recently, a committee met and declared that the Bible, the church, and Christians are sexist, opposed to the rights of others. Oklahoma, just this week, the Supreme Court of Oklahoma, has, they've set up a statute, not a statute, but a, the Ten Commandments, and um, by approval of the courts, by the way, and now they've got, you've got to take that down. You've got 60 days to get it off. I hope and pray, I hope and pray that Oklahoma will take the stand that they know. You see, the problem is, is that we as Christians have, have cowered down. You know, our schools cower down because they have to have that federal money. And anything the federal government gives to you comes with strings. Everything. Everything. And our school systems are saying, wait, hey, we, we can't survive without federal money. You'd be surprised what you can do without federal money. But because of fear of, of, of losing our funding, we said, no, we've, we've got to cow down to this. We've got to, we've got to back down. We've got to, we've got to do what they say. And now they're impressing the churches to back down. And in this day and time, I will guarantee you there are churches, in fact, there are churches right now that have said, First Baptist Church in, in North Carolina uh, has said, we will accept same-sex marriage and we will perform those marriages. Mainline denomination that's happening all across America. What laws, I said last week, did Kim Davis break? She didn't break any law at all. They made a ruling that was unconstitutional. They made a ruling that was anti, was against the law because no law had been passed by Congress that stated that marriage was defined as between anybody that was consenting. It still defines marriage as one man and one woman. Surprisingly that we are seeing marches against those who, that are standing against abominations. God warned that his word in the last days would be falling away. That those that believe the word of God would be falling away first. That falling away is an apostasy, a turning of, of the local church. We've lost the respect of, of the populace. And now a laughing stock in the field that we once influenced. In 2008, California voted down Proposition 8. Proposition 8, surprisingly enough, was for same-sex marriage. That refusal by the state to uphold same-sex marriage. Prote protesters attacked those who were instrumental in defeating those in favor of changing the definition of traditional marriage. Thousands marched, protested outside of churches, and even disrupt ser disrupted services. Even though I don't support the Mormon church, they were attacked in Salt Lake City on November the 14th of 2008 with more than 3,000 protesters with signs that read, I didn't vote on your marriage. Mormons once persecuted, now persecutors. Jesus said, love everyone. I love that one. If Jesus were here today, he would accept this. Another sign read, proud of my two moms. 
So what does this have to do with the church? It has a lot to do with the church. As we look at the church of Laodicea, the last church that, that Jesus addressed is a church that is in existence today. By the way, uh, I will tell you that all seven churches are in existence today in some form or some semblance. Every one of them. When you talk about prophecy, prophecy just get, not only gives you the, the immediate, but it also tells you something that's going to happen in the future. And this is where we're at in America today. We're in the, in the age of the church of the Laodiceans. In fact, notice the terminology in verse number 14. And, the, and the, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. If you go back and look in chapter number 2, Verse number one, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Chapter two, verse one. Chapter two, verse eight, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write. Chapter 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write. Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write. Chapter three, verse one, unto the angel of the church of Sardis write. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. You see a change there? Do you see the change? To the angel of the church of Sardis. Now he says to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. It's the church of the people. And that's where we're at today. It started with this mega church movement. Bill Hybels. What we need to do is we need to go into the community. We don't need to knock on doors and say, if you were to die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? What we need to do is we need to knock on the door and say, hey, uh, I'm from X church here in, our, in your community, and we want to know, if you came to our church, what would you like to hear? What would you like to see? What, would you, what programs would you like to have? And they built their churches around those programs, around what the people wanted to hear, not what God said. And then Bill Hybels come back later after all of these 20 years of, uh, of this mega church and this pushing out of, uh, of, of what I want and what I want to accept and what I want to be to say it doesn't work. Because what we did is we filled churches with people who have no desire for God, who have no desire for doing what's right, who have no desire to support the church, who have no desire for anything, and these mega churches are closing right and left because they cannot keep up with the financial obligation that they put themselves under. Drive around our, our, our communities, Houston and surrounding areas. Jesus had a condemnation for them. The church was plagued with several problems. Number one, they were lukewarm. Worthless. Worthless. Lukewarm means indifferent. It means no heart for God or for the work of God. That's where we're at today. That's why more, more people would rather stay home and get ready for the Texans game that's going to be starting today since regular season starts today than to be in church. My neighborhood is already packed with people pulling out their grills and all of that stuff getting ready for a game rather than bringing their kids to church to hear the word of God. It's the worthless because they had no zeal for the Lord. Jesus said that he would spew them out of his mouth. King James Study Bible put uh, out by Liberty University noted this in the, in the note on this verse. The church is likened to lukewarm water as being virtually worthless. Christ says he will spew them out or reject them from his company. The hot waters uh, nearby Heropolis were known for their medicinal qualities, whereas Colossae was known for its cold, pure water, but Laodicea was forced to receive water by aqueduct from other areas. By the time the, it arrived to Laodicea, it was lukewarm and provoked nausea. That's where God says the church is today. It provokes nausea in him. Notice also it says that they were rich, increased with goods, and had need of nothing. They had everything. We live in America in a materialistic society. A materialistic society. What my parents worked hard for, labored for, and by the way taught us as ch their children to work and labor for, is now handed out to our children. 
They don't have to clean their rooms. They don't have to take out the trash. They don't have to mow the yards. They don't have to do anything because, hey, your only job is to get an education. We want you to get a good education. More homes than not are racked by drug abuse. Drug abuse. Sexual immorality. How are we doing? I don't know how many parents I've had come to me and say, man, my, my child needs help. They need to be at the RU program. And I'm sorry to tell them, if your child's not ready, ready to be in the RU program, it's not going to help them. It's not going to help them. And I've seen it too many times. Grandma brings the, 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 the grandchild in and sets them down. You're going to be here. They're gone. They're not going to put up with it. They don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because they like what they're doing. They like the way they live. They've not come to that place in their life that they're willing to give it up. You see, the problem in America is that we're so materialistic. If we went through our houses, we would see things that, as a kid, I never saw. When I was a kid, we played with matchboxes, rubber bands. We made little cars out of them. You remember that? We played jacks. We was really good at it. We played out in the yard. Sometimes, to our parents' chagrin, we'd jump off the house and go back and jump off again. And jump. I mean, anybody can I have a witness? I mean, we, we did all kinds of stupid stuff. Maybe even tied our brothers to the trees. I don't know. <laughs> That's for Brother Gary. I mean, we played out in the yard. We, we played kick the can. We played hide and seek. We, I mean, we, we did all kinds. Of, and now the kids, you go outside and play. I don't want to. Come to supper. I don't want, I'm not hungry. Yeah, that would go well with my house, I'm sure. Even today in time, it doesn't go well. Why? Because, well, I just can't make my kids mine. Really? I tell my kids, this is my house. The doors are mine. The electricity's mine. The clothes on your back are mine. The iPhone in your pocket belongs to me. The iPad belongs to me. The internet belongs to me. Everything belongs to me. You'll either do what I say or you won't have any of it. And I'm not opposed to taking the doors off the hinges. I'm not opposed to taking the bed out of the, out of the bedroom and letting them sleep on a pallet on the floor. I'm not opposed to them wearing Walmart jeans. Why? Because we've raised a society that is so materialistic, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And that's exactly the way the Laodicean church was. Notice what he says. You're increased with goods. Notice verse number 17, I, thou said, I am rich, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. That's our society today. You go through a, a, a ritzy neighborhood, and you knock on doors, and people, I don't need this. I'm not interested. I don't need God. One of these days they're going to need God. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. See, Jesus told them that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. He said, I want to give you true gold or buy of me true gold. What is true gold? <laughs> true wealth is gold. Virtue, white raiment. Vision, eyesight. He urges them to repent. You see, when you look at it, God provides everything we need. Everything we need. Most of us want to work hours upon hours upon hours. We take time away from our family. That's why we're losing our children. Our wives and, our, and, and ourselves are working more than one job to make ends meet because we can't afford all of this that we have. It amazes me in my neighborhood, and I live right back here. We've got young couples in their early 20s that have a two-story house, paid over $160,000 to $200,000 for it. Uh, they've got uh, uh, two brand-new cars in the garage. They've got boats. They've got uh, uh, jet skis. They've got everything in the world. Their kids are dressed in the best of the dress. Eight-year-olds with iPhones. 
Why? They've got the latest of all the video games, of all the video consoles, and then we wonder why we're losing them. Because we're giving them things instead of giving them our quality time. Quality time. That's where we're losing. And that's what prob the problem in the church is. The New Testament church of our day has become like the church of Laodicea. The United States has become intolerant of the evangelical Christianity and is now attacking every avenue de uh, of decency and right. We are now the enemy. We're the foe. But if it wasn't for all of these religious bigots that, that stood against this and, and, and brought this Bible stuff into it, this just in. One day they will be without us religious bigots. And they'll be without the Bible. And then they're going to be running to the church. But Steve sings a song, One Day Too Late. You came one day too late. The problem in our society is, is that we have lost it, uh, lost focus. Chuck Colson put it this way. He said, the culture it, it, it is religion incarnate. Think about that. What did we get, where did we get our values? Where did we get our morals? Why do we put so much value in human life? They came from a sense of our value from our religious upbringings based on the Christian principles of the Word of God. Colson went on to say this, we rail against our declining culture in a reflection, is a ref uh, we rail against our declining culture, which is a reflection of us as Christians. Then, who's to blame for our declining culture? Has the church in America become Christianity light or like Coke, the Coke product, Christianity zero? Michael Spencer said this, intolerance of Christianity will rise to levels many of us have not believed possible in our lifetimes. And public policy will become hostile towards evangelical Christians, seeing it is the opponent of the common good. Evangelicals will increasingly be seen as a threat to cultural pro uh, progress. Public leaders will consider us bad for America, bad for education, bad for children, and bad for society. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Do you realize what Hitler did when he took over Ger Nazi Germany? Or wasn't Nazi Germany then when he took over Germany? He got all the kids under his educational processes. In fact, Germany now has just passed laws that, they can't, that you cannot homeschool your children. America, you can still home your, homeschool your te children. Texas is one of those schools that allows you to homeschool your children. But Lord Terry is coming. Watch out. If you homeschool, that's it. That's done for. They don't want us in private. They don't want your children in private schools. They don't want your children <laughs> with parents who have such a bigoted idea against the reforms of our nation. And believe me, Obama is following Hitler's path to bring us to this place. George Barna, who did a poll recently, revealed that only one percent of Christians interviewed subscribe to all thirteen. Basic doctrine principles of the Christian faith. One percent. What does that tell us? We're going the way of Laodicea. Colson says, America's, Americans should not be too surprised that our culture continues to spiral downward if we are blind to our true spiritual condition as an end times church. Our prayer should be that we see our true spiritual condition as God sees it. What can we do? Take your Bibles and turn back to Ezekiel chapter number 20. Ezekiel chapter number 22, I'm sorry. Ezekiel chapter number 22. For sake of time, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I, I, I encourage you to read it. I told you this before, that, that Israel is Israel. Israel, Israel, is Israel. No other nation is Israel. Israel is God's chosen people. It's Israel that God works with, but 
you can compare Israel with the United States. We have we have had the blessings of God upon our our country since we came here in 1620. We've had the blessings of God. Our our forefathers came for religious freedom from England and from uh, from other areas where they were persecuted because of their religious beliefs. And, and they came here and they established a nation conceived in liberty and and to the proposition that all men were created equal and to the religious uh, re freedoms. Uh, that we have, that no man can make a law regarding the establishment of religion. By the way, if you read the Constitution, it does not. It says nothing about separation of church and state. Nothing. That was perpetrated by a bunch of liars who tried to change the law in history. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I, I just kind of want to pick up in verse number, uh, verse number 24. God has given a message to Ezekiel to give to the people. Verse number 24 says, Son of man, say unto her that thou art a land that is not cleansed nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure of the precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid them, their eyes from the, my Sabbath. And I am profaned among them. Did you notice the, how many times they use the word profaned? Profaned in that verse. That's religious apostasy. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. What is it that, that uh, is going on in this nation? They have turned their backs upon God. The prophets and the priests have said, Hey, <laughs> we got this. We, we, we're doing okay. Jeremiah gave a message and, and, and he said, This is what God said. And they, they, they railed upon and they persecuted Jeremiah. And they said, God hasn't spoken to you. One of them came and smote him and said, uh, uh, by, by this... Uh, 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 this ephod uh, that I've girdled, that I've ripped in two, uh, God is not going to do this. And so Jeremiah took a, 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 a yoke of iron and said, if you can break this, then you're going to break God's command. They imprisoned him. God hasn't spoken to you. God hasn't, hasn't spoken through your mouth. God hasn't spoken words to you. We know what's best for us. That's our society right now. We know what's best. It's all predicated on the, on the idea that I'm good within myself. And Isaiah says in Isaiah 64, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the sight of God. Notice verse number 20, or verse number 30. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy. God says, I'm looking for a man, for a woman, for a people that would stand in the gap. Years ago, talking about the games we played in the yard, did you all remember playing Red Rover, Red Rover? And we always tried to hold, and we the ones that we didn't want our team, we held tighter, we braced arms, you know. Because we didn't want to mire our team because we knew they were a weak link, right? God knows who the weak links are. And we don't want them on our team. We want to stand strong. We want to stand firm. And God says this, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it.
four words close that verse out. But I found none. I found none. I found none. The problem in America is not President Obama. Breathe. The problem in America is not the Supreme Court and their bad decisions. Breathe. The problem in America is not the Congress or the House of Representatives, the legislative body of America. Breathe. The problem in America are the men who stand behind this pulpit. Stand right here. You see, there's a lot of guys standing back here that are not preaching the truth of the Word of God. They're liars. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. How do you know them? When they stand up and put a big smile on their face and say, God, God loves you so much. And he wants you to be the best that you can be. Just, just, just be the best you can be. 40,000. 80,000, they boast, are listening to that message of just be the best that you can be. God knows that we're not perfect. God knows that we're, that we're going to fail. But we just need to be the best. I challenge you to read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Micah, Obadiah, Jonah, Haggai, Malachi, Zechariah. I challenge you to read the prophets and find out how many of them stood up and said, See, the problem is, that is, that's what spouted off in our society. Well, God just loves everybody. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. Yes, he loves the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world that they may have life and have it more abundantly. We're sinners. The Bible is very clear and very very plain. We are all sinners that need to be saved. We have to put our life, we have to put our, our, our trust, our hope, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and allow him to cleanse us from our sin. And that was the message of the prophets of old. Turn, 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 repent, repent, repent. But now we're getting that, well, God loves us. God is a loving God, and he wouldn't send anybody to hell. That awful place. Folks, God doesn't send anybody to hell. It's a choice. It's a choice. You are given the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life before you die. You're given that opportunity. But once you reject that opportunity and you die without Christ, there's no more hope. I don't care what the Catholic Church teaches. I don't care how many how many millions of dollars you give to the Catholic Church, you're going to burn in hell. Because you chose to reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. That is the ultimate sin. Rejection of Jesus Christ. But in our churches today, we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. We want to build beautiful edifices. And this is a beautiful building. I'm so thankful that God gave it to us. One day they'll come and they'll close the doors. You say, oh, that will never happen in America. Yeah, they would never kick prayer out of schools and they would never allow abortion and they would never allow same-sex marriage and they would never... Yeah, one of these days you're going to come and the doors are going to be latched, locked. 
padlocked. And then you're going to be beating on the door. Hey, I want to get in. When they padlock the door, unless and even if they're standing out there with M16 rifles, I'm going to stand on the steps and I'm going to preach the gospel, the truth of the word of God. And they can shoot me. And I can say the same thing that, that uh, uh, John R. Rice said years ago to that thief that was trying to steal his bill. Oh, you can't scare me with heaven. You see, we need to get busy as God's people, standing in the gap. Thankfully, nothing happened on 9-11 this year. Thankfully. But don't think we're out of the water. Don't think that we're not right for God's judgment. If you're not right with God, you need to get right with God. If you're unsaved, you need to get saved. If you're saved and you have unsaved loved ones, if you have unsaved neighbors, if you have unsaved co-workers, people that you deal with on a daily basis, you need to be busy of getting the message out to this lost and dying world. The priests and the prophets preach lives leading people to hell. There is a truth. There's only one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. Oprah Winfrey said, I just don't see how there's not many ways to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He didn't say, now there are many ways. There's my way, and there's Muhammad's way, and there's Confucius' way. There's one way. And that's through Jesus Christ and him alone. Oprah Winfrey one day will stand before God with her way. And if it's not Jesus, he will say, depart from me, work for me. I never, never stand before prayer. Father, we thank you today for your blessings. Lord, I just pray. Lord, I, I realize that the last two weeks we've talked about America. We've talked about the, uh, the need for America. But Lord, this is real. If you tarry your coming, America not being in prophecy, but now being a world leader, not working, not seeing them, but Russia infiltrates and tries to take over Israel. America has always stood for Israel. And now we're backing down. We're saying, hey, you give up your land for peace. We're going to have two states. We're going to take your land and we're going to give it to those Palestinians. And we're going to, and God said, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. And America is the very first one in line from Bush, first President Bush, all the way through Obama. Let's give up your land if you want peace. Give up your land if you want peace. And one day they might get them to sign a treaty. And we're going to give up our land for peace and have two Palestinian states. But when they do, America will be done for and will be finished. And then Russia is going to come in and think that they're going to do justice. And they're going to take over the land. And God's going to fight Israel's battle because that's who always fights Israel's battles. Father, I just pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be mindful of where we stand with you this morning. If there's some here that are unsaved, Lord, I pray that they come to know Christ as Savior and Lord of their life. Lord, if there's those this morning, Lord, that uh, are saved, and have loved ones who are unsaved, family members or uh, neighbors or co-workers, Lord, that we'd be praying that you give us opportunity. Lord, if there's some things in our life that are inconsistent with the truths of the Word of God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to confess that as sin, turn from it, and have a revival in our own Wilt thou not revive us again, thy people may rejoice in thee. As we pray in Jesus' name.